Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Ketubo Tzach Tzadi. Wishing everyone a Gemar Chatima Tova. And good fast. We are going to get started now with the bottom of Pei Tzadam Ben. We saw yesterday was a case of Chugitin, Chugtubot, all sorts of possibilities. Most of them were situations where the woman was married, divorced, and then remarried, and then either he died or he divorced her again. So either there's a get and a death certificate, or there's, you know, not exactly a certificate, but proof of death, and, or there's Chugitin. And the question is, could she collect Chugtubo based on that? So we said that she can only collect two two boat if she has two two boat because otherwise we can assume the husband right normally there's this assumption he normally gives a ktuba continues the same ktuba he doesn't necessarily when he remarries the same wife and he hadn't paid her the ktuba yet he doesn't give her a new ktuba he just continues the original ktuba and unless we actually have a ktuba in hand and this is all based on the previous gemara where we learned that she could get her she could take her get. She could use her get to get her ketubah money. So the question is, here we have two, get, two gets. Can she get two ketubah monies? And the answer is no. Because we assume right, one get, yes, allows you to get your ketubah, but two gets doesn't. Okay? Because we assume, right, almanak ketubah rishona machzira. By the way, about this ripping the get, I, I looked up, I forgot yesterday. The reason we rip a get nowadays is not because of the reason we saw yesterday. Okay? We rip up a get at the ceremony. So according to yesterday's Gemara, they ripped up the get once she got her ketuba money so that she would be able to demand her ketuba money again. Nowadays, we rip up a get because they don't want anyone to come along and find some mistake in the get and say you're not really divorced. So they rip it up right away so that there's no one who can come later and start making a stink and saying, oh, wait, this wasn't written properly, this wasn't this properly, and you're not really divorced. We want to avoid a situation like that, and that's why we tear the get. So even though both are talking about tear and gets, it's for two totally different reasons. Okay, so now, Tana Wabanam. We're starting at the bottom. Hotzi'a get uktuba umita. So she produces a get, she produces a ktuba, and she says, and I was remarried, and now my husband died. So she wants to get two ktubas. Well, it depends. In get, kodem l'ktuba. If the date on the get was before the ktuba, then it's obvious that what? The ketuba was from her second marriage. And therefore, with her get, she can get the first ketuba payment. With the ketuba, she can get her second ketuba payment because the dates make it very clear that in this case, he gave her another ketuba for the second marriage. And therefore, govesh te ketubot. Ketuba kodem the get. But if the date of the ketuba is before the get, then it's obvious that if she doesn't produce a second ketuba, then she can only get based on the first divorce, the same ketubah we can assume, right, she can get based on her one ketubah that we can assume he reused the second time. So I just want to make sure you understand this concept. This means a man divorces his wife, he's supposed to give her ketubah money, but before he does that, he decides I'm going to remarry her and then basically just reinstates the ketubah. So it makes a lot of sense. Okay, new Mishnah. This Mishnah seems to be connected to the previous because it's also about somewhere where something happens later that we assume is connected to something that happened earlier. So, Katan Shisi Aviv. We have a minor whose father betrothes him and, or get, marries him off. Ketubata Kayemet. Ashalmana Kem Kima. He's, let's say, uh, 10 years old, gets married, gives her a ketuba, but his ketuba is invalid because he's not of age to promise any of these kind of things. But when he turns 13 and becomes of age, again, wherever exactly, you know, in Tusimani, then when he matures, he basically is still his old ketuba that he gave then that didn't really have so much validity, now becomes valid. Likewise, Gershin Itgaira Ishto Imo, if you have a convert. He was married to his wife, both of them were not Jewish, and then they both converted. And it's kind of like they got a new marriage. But they had a ketubah. Now, why they have a ketubah? Probably they just had some sort of financial arrangement because that's really what a ketubah is. The financial arrangement from before is still in place. Because when he married her the second time, Jewishly, the idea was that whatever arrangement we had, we're going to continue. Now, the simple reading of this mission is going to be definitely explained very differently by the end of the Gemara to the extent that you're going to say, why do we even have this Mishnah, which is what Tosfot's going to ask. So we'll get to that in a minute. 
Anu Rafuna, Moshanu Ela Manimatayim. Rafuna says we're only talking about 100 or 200, the base obligation of the Ketuba. Aval Tosefet Emla, but if he promised her, in addition to the 200 zoos, let's say she was a virgin, he promised her, you know, she gets the 200 zoos, and then he promised her extra money. That's not going to be valid here. Okay? And then that really changes the whole meaning of what he means. Tuba Takayemet. Right? So according to Rav Huna, we're only talking about the Manema Taim, about Tosef and Eila. Any additions, she doesn't get. Now, according to Rav Huna, it's very difficult because then basically... They don't even need a ketubah for that. We already learned. Masabetin. Anyone who doesn't give a ketubah, they have a ketubah anyway. So Tosa says, according to Rafuna, what on earth was the Mishnah telling us then? So Tosa answers that what it could be telling us is something like the following. When she got married the first time, how much does she deserve in her ketubah? 200, because she was a virgin. Let's say, right, assuming she's been married for a few years, she's no longer a virgin, now you're going to say the marriage really only clicks in on the Torah level when he becomes mature, which means that at this point, she actually is only deserving of a hundred. So what the Mish is telling you is the, the details of was she a virgin or was she not a virgin goes back to the beginning. Okay, we don't start the clock ticking from here. We start it from there, even though it's really only the Tanai Beitin and not the Tosefet. Rabbi Yehuda, who makes a lot more sense, says a filu Tosefet Yeshla. And that makes a lot more sense with the simple reading of the mission. The problem's going to be the Gemara is going to entirely reject Rav Yehuda. So we're ending with actually understanding that the mission is explained like Rav Huna, which is really, she doesn't get any agreement they had before. It's really not so valid. It's just that she gets manema time for whatever it was from the beginning of the marriage. Meitim. So here's our question against Rav Yehuda. It says, Chid Shu. If he adds something more once he becomes of age or once they convert, no tell it Masha Khidshu, then she can get the extra that he promised then. Which sounds like Khidshu in Lo Khidshu Lo. It sounds like she can only get more than the regular amount if he added something once they were married. Which is not really true. Gemara says Lo, Emma Af Masha Khidshu. You could say even. In other words, in the event that he added, let's say he added two hundred in the beginning to the original two hundred, and then he added another two hundred later, altogether she can collect six hundred. Explain it that way, and then it doesn't go against Ruf. Uh, Rav Yehuda, but now the Gemara is going to bring a different bright to this is clearly against Rav, Huna, uh, Rav Yehuda, sorry, and that's why we're going to reject him in the end. V'halo tanehachi, but it doesn't it say this? Chidshu no telet masha chidshu. If they added something, she could get the extra that they added. Lo chidshu, but if they didn't add anything, bitula gova matayim va'almana mana. Then a virgin gets 200 and a, and a, a widow 100, and that's it. They don't get any extra. Tiyuv to the Rav Yehuda. This really goes against Rav Yehuda, in which case they try to at least explain where Rav Yehuda got it from, which is the same reason we thought he was right, which is Rav Yehuda matnitin at ite. The language of the Mishnah confused him. Who saval ktuba akula miltakai? He thought ktuba takayemet means her ktuba, whatever he promised her in the ktuba, is valid. Still stands. Vilohi, but it's not true. At ikar ktuba kai. It's just referring to the basics of the ktuba. And with that, Hadrat Alacha Kotev Lishto, and moving on to the next chapter. Mishayana Sui Shte Nashim Vamit. Okay. Someone's married, we're going to have two cases of a man dying and with two wives. So the first case is he buries two wives and then he dies. Harishona Kodemet Lashniya. The first, who gets, the, let's say he doesn't have enough money for both ketubas. So the first one collects first because she has an earlier date. She gets it first. Both women died then, the, the heirs of the first, yet before the heirs of the second. That's a pretty simple case. The next case is going to be a, quite complicated. Nasa, and it's going to lead to all sorts of complications uh, at the, at the, later on. Nasa tarishona umeta. So now he marries, okay, I see you're asking about a, a, a man katlan. This is different. This is, he died once. Right? And he, in other words, he's the one who died, not the women. So anyway, he dies, leaves two wives. In the second case, he dies in the middle. Okay, so let's see. Nasa tarishona vameta. First he marries her, then she dies. Nasa shnia vemetu. Then the second wife, he marries. It doesn't really matter when he marries her, whether he was married to the first wife, wasn't married to the first wife, but he gets remarried. 
and metu, and then he dies. So now you have two things going on. This is what's going to cause all sorts of complications. What happens to each woman's ketubah? So the second wife is presumably still alive, although we're going to talk about her or her Yorshim, or maybe even if she died before she gets her ketubah. She obviously gets her ketubah money because right, he died, and the husband dies, he's supposed to give his wife the ketubah. The first wife died before the husband. What happens to her ketubah? Remember? He inherits the ketubah when she dies. And then, in order, remember the rabbis instituted that in order for fathers to give big dowries and not worry that they'll say, oh, well, my wife's going to die, maybe. My daughter's going to die first, maybe. The husband will inherit her. Then all his children, even from other wives, are going to inherit my dowry. So they said, Ketubah benin dichrin, this is what we say, the male children inherit her tuba. So how does that work? Her tuba first goes to her husband when she dies. Then, when the husband goes to split up his Yerusha, he basically divides one portion, like the portion that was deserved before he gives out all of his estate. He's basically going to give the children of that mother the Ketubah ben Indichrin, all of right, whatever the value of her thing was. So to make things easy today, we're going to give an example to make it simpler. Okay, and through tomorrow's class as well. Let's just assume the first wife, which is going to turn into the Ketubah ben Indichrin, is a 500 Zeus Ketubah. Okay, he added, I'm giving a, a big difference just so that it, it's kind of, sometimes in extreme cases, it's easier to understand better. So she gets 500 zoos, okay? That was her ketubah. The second ketubah was 200 zoos. So now, he dies, and let's say he has 700 zoos in his property. So what's going to happen with that money? So it says here in the Mishnah, So the second wife, if she's alive, or her heirs, if she's not alive, right? Now, she would have to die after him, but she, as soon as she dies after him, and then, there, and then she has heirs, they're going to first get the ketubah because basic laws, right? Torah law is there's no ketubah in Dichrin. So Torah law is she's oh right? Her ketubah. So she gets her ketubah no matter what. So the first 200 zoos comes out of the estate, goes straight to, this is like what we call a Baal Chol. It's like a creditor. They're owed a debt. He pays that. Now we're left with 500. There's two options of what could happen with that 500. It doesn't say anything about the 500 in the mission. All it says in the mission is, the second one and their heirs get to get the money before the heirs of the first. Because it mentions heirs of the first, the Gemara is going to assume that what are they heirs of the first wife means it's relating to their Ketubah Benin Dichrin. And then they're going to learn that in this case, the 500 then will go to the other sons. Okay, this is going to create a bunch of problems. I'm going to leave it for right now because the Gemara is first going to deal with the, the first case. But I wanted to a little bit set up some of the information because this whole thing of Tuba is different. You're going to learn a lot of new things. It's a lot of information. So hopefully it will be clear by the end of today and also tomorrow the same concepts are going to be reviewed. So again, we have two cases in our mission just to review in case I got you off track. A man is married to two women. He dies. And now both of them need to um, inherit the Ketuba. So who's going to get first? The first wife gets first. Then, if he marries two women and the first wife, right? This is almost like saying the reverse, though, happens here. In a certain case, the second wife is going to get first. And that's in the case that the first wife died first, then the husband died, then the second wife has first dibs to her ketubah because she's owed a ketubah, whereas the first woman's ketubah is already kind of gone. It's not 100% gone because there is this ketubah named Dichrin, but that's only a, a rabbinic institution and first really comes the obligation of the ketubah to the second wife. Okay, which we will get back to and understand that case a lot better very soon. So the first thing they say is, A bunch of things they're going to talk about our language in the mission today. So make inferences from the language. So the first inference they try to make, we're going to see this exact suga and the flip of it. There's going to be two versions of how to infer from the mission of the first case. It says, So someone's married to two wives. The first one gets before the second. Velo katane harishona yeshla. Vashnia Enla doesn't say the first one gets and the second one doesn't. Michla, from here you can infer that the first one, the second one also has rights to the ketubah. And if in fact she were to go and take the money, if she grabbed the money first, we don't take it away from her. 
So if she demanded her tuba first and just took it, we wouldn't actually take the money out. There's a whole thing in, in, in Jewish law, which is a bit of a strange concept. But that once somebody grabs something, we've seen it before, right? And it's in their hands. We don't necessarily take it away from them. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It's always a debate whether we do or whether we don't. It sort of depends on how much of a right they have to the money. So now, Shmami, now what can you infer from here? So again, it's just an inference. Not clear from the mission. In a minute, we're going to say you don't, can't necessarily infer this from the mission. But because it says the first one has first rights to it before the second, but it doesn't say the second one doesn't have any rights, it sounds like if she were to take it, we wouldn't take it out of her hands unless say there's only 200. She took the 200, it's hers, and the first one loses that. We can infer from here to regular loans. If a creditor takes, right, you owe money to me and to somebody else, and I'm owed the money today, and they're owed the money tomorrow, and they go and grab the money from you today, okay, before me, even though I'm supposed to get it first, what they did, what they did is, is done, and I have nothing to do about it. I can't take it away from them. That's what seems to be inferred. To which the Gemara says, No, la olame ma lacha masha gava lo gava. Umay kodemet legam, umay kodemet legam rei katane. No, when it says she comes first, right? You infer it, she comes first, which means she comes first, but the other one still has rights. No, she comes first means it goes to her and it doesn't go to the second, if that's all there is. And how do we know that the word kodemet could sometimes mean exclusively, right? She's the only one who has rights. Because it's not ben kodem lebat. Son comes before the daughter when it comes to inheritance. The daughters don't inherit at all. That shows kodem doesn't mean you can get later or if you took, it's yours. No, if, you, if the daughter takes, it's not hers. She doesn't inherit. So there you see. Basically, again, it means the second wife still can get her tuba money, but only if there's enough. And she can't come and get it before the first. Now we're going to do the reverse. In other words, again, what we see here is it's not conclusive. It could go either way. And that's exactly what they're going to do the second time. So the second time is going to start with where the, where the first option ended. Okay? katani From the fact that it doesn't say, Because it doesn't say, if she grabbed it, we leave it in her hands. Therefore, Michal, you can infer, you can assume this one understands code meme as she has first rights and the only rights. And if the second one were to take, it's nothing. That's the assumption they make. So in which case they would say, Shmami, now you can infer from here about Chomucha, Shekadam Begava, Mashagava, Logava. If the second date creditor, the later date, comes and takes it before I'm um, due my money, that doesn't work. I can take it out of their hands. To which they say, No. Lo Gava. No, you could say what they took, they took. I did the Tana Shnia, the Yorsha, Kodmim, the Yorsha, Rishona, Tana Nani, a Rishona, Kodem, the Shnia. But because it said the second and her heirs come before the first heirs, from there you can learn Tana Nani, uh, sorry, because it used that language, Tana Nani, a Rishona, Kodem, the Shnia. It also said the first one is before the second one. But not because, in other words, they had to say who comes first, but not because it was trying to say that. You can't, you know, that we won't take it out of their hands. No. You could theoretically say, I'm sorry, you could theoretically say that it's theirs, okay? And they can keep it if they took it. We're just trying to say who's supposed to get it first. Next. Now we get into the more complicated part of today's stuff. Shmami Natlat. So again, let's just go back and repeat that, lot, that second line of the mission. If he marries the first woman, and then she dies, which means her ketubah went and was inherited by the husband and only later will be inherited by her sons when the husband dies. And then mate, and then he marries another woman, Nasashnia, and then he dies. Then Shnia, either the second wife or her heirs, if she were to die after that, get the ketubah first before the Yorshe Harishona, before the second wife's heirs. Now, we're going to infer three laws from here. Shmamina, echat b'chaya ve'echat b'moto yesh lahen ketubah benin dichrin ve'lo cheshinan le'insuye. We can infer from here, and this is the case we're going to talk about for the rest of today. Echat b'chaya ve'echat b'moto. This means 
if one dies during the lifetime of the husband and one dies after the lifetime of the husband, which is a, a possible case that was mentioned in the Mishnah, right? Either she or her heirs. So if it's her heirs, that means she died and she died obviously after the husband. So one died when the husband was alive and one died after the husband died. That's echap echayav echap emoto. That's exactly our case. Now in this case, what are we going to learn from our Mishnah? Yesh lahen ketuba benin dichrin velo chayshinan leinsuye. The laws of Ketubah Benin Dichrin apply, and we're not worried about it creating a fight. Okay, let's talk about what the flip side of this would be, and what fight would potentially be created that maybe we'd be concerned about, that we're going to see there's an opinion that says you don't get Ketubah Benin Dichrin in this case. So again, let's go back to our case where there was 200, there was 700 altogether. The husband dies, and the wife is deserving of Ketubah, the second wife. She dies, her heirs come forward and say, we want her Ketubah. So they get 200, nobody disagrees with that. That's clear. Now what's left? What's left is only 500. The first, the sons of the first wife want to get their 500. Well, what's the problem? The problem is that while the first, while the first, okay, it's tricky, who's first, second? The, the group of sons who collected first, which is the second wife's kids, they collected a ketuba, so they got 200, but they got that as a chov. That means... Right? Their mother was owed money, and they inherited that. They're creditors, basically. So they can come and claim, if you take 500 as inheritance, you have to remember, Ketuba named, right, so the, I want to distinguish. Ketuba, the Ketuba is a payment he has to pay. That's an obligation. Then, Ketuba named Dichrin is laws of inheritance. How do we divide up the inheritance? Well, when it comes to dividing up the inheritance between all the sons, we're going to give, right, your male children, the wife's male children, they're going to get more, let's say, because her ketubah was higher. Okay, so in a regular case, for example, let's say one ketubah was 500, one was 200, the husband dies first. All the women are supposed to get the ketubah, but the women dies. The women's all, uh, sorry, the opposite. The women both died first, and then the husband died. So now he has two ketubah in different on him, right? So he'll divide the money based on the right all the sons will get just they'll each get based on how much money their mother had if there's money left they'll divide it evenly between them now the issue is this there's a big there's a few issues number one issue is in order to ketubah in dichrin is a is an institution of the rabbis in order to prevent fathers from giving low dowries they got rid of this at a certain point once fathers i've told you this once fathers gave higher dowries anyway they got rid of this takana but for a while, this takana was in place, more like in the time of the Gaonim. But before that, the takana was in place. When the takana is in place, there's a problem. Because you have to also have, this overrides Torah laws of inheritance. If, let's say, there's not enough money, and one group of sons is going to inherit all the property, then the other sons don't inherit at all. Now, the Torah says that the property is divided evenly between the father's sons. So there's this law that there has to be motar dinar. In order to collect tuba benin dichrin, you have to have at least a dinar's worth of property or money to divide evenly between the brothers. If there's no evenly divided property of the brothers, then you can't collect your tuba benin dichrin because the Torah laws of inheritance haven't applied. Okay, I see you're asking about a Bechor. I don't know how the Bechor fits into this, but even the Dinar, I guess, would be divided up by the Bechor. Tubin and Dichrin, I, I think, doesn't have to do with Bechor, or maybe her Bechor gets more. I'm not, I don't think so, no. Bechor would only be the first, the way the Bechor would fit into this would be like this. Let's say the Bechor of this father is from a different marriage. So when you have that one Dinar that's left, or whatever that's left to be divided evenly, he'll get two portions of it, and everyone else will get one portion. I mean, obviously, you're going to split this dinar into almost nothing. It's not a lot of money. But the halach is there has to be at least something for there to have the Torah laws of inheritance apply. If they don't apply, you can't get ketubin in dinar. Okay? So that's important to understand for this. So let's get started. Shema mina, chaba chayav ha-chapa boto, yesh lahem ketubin in dinar, v'lo chayshina lin suye. Now, if we go back to our example, and there was only 700, and those took 200, and those took 500, forget about the motar dinar for now, we'll get back to that later. One took 200, one took 500. The 200 will say, forget about it. It doesn't really matter how much they got. And maybe they got 500 and they got 200. It doesn't really matter. But they'll say, wait a minute. 
we didn't get any inheritance. The first ones will say, what do you mean you didn't get inheritance? You just got 200 check off, uh, 200 zoos for the ketubah. And they'll say, but yeah, that was, that was a hope. That was what the father owed us because of our mothers, he owed the mother the ketubah money. That was just a, a, an owing us. But we didn't get any inheritance and that's not fair. How can you get all 500 of what's left? The 500 should be split evenly. That's the concern of fighting. Comes the Gemara and says, clearly the, the Mishnah is not concerned for this. Because what does the Mishnah say? Okay, we're going to read it in, in, inside here. Mimai, from where do we get this? Midikatane shnia v'yorsheha kodmim l'yorshe rishona. Now, notice the words, the yorshim of the first. Now, what kind of yorshim, heirs of the first? Heirs of the first means they're heirs and they want to inherit her ketuba. So, it says, Mikdam hudikadme ha'ika shakle. Yes, it's true, the second wife gets first precedence, but that, they get first dibs. That means the first one goes to the, the second wife's kids, right? The, well, the first money that's there goes. But if there's more money left, it sounds like the heirs of the first can get what they're deserving as heirs, which would be Ketubah Benin Dichrin. Okay? Sumer is going to explain the mission differently. But that's the first inference from our mission. Because it sounds like after the 200 is collected, they can collect the 500. Even if the other heirs might be left with nothing. They'll get no inheritance. Ushmamina. Now, what about the motar? Right? There was no motar in this case. Shmamina. Ketubah na'aseit motar lechaverta. Now, first of all, you have to notice, the mission never talked about an amount. Maybe there was, there was Motar, right? That's a bit of a, that's going to be another question on this assumption here. But they're assuming maybe there's the minimum that there is. And then what it means is, the fact that the first one's got a Ketubah, that's already considered Motar. In other words, what's the issue? Everyone has to get something by Torah law. They got something. Now, it's true it was an, it was an obligation. It was, a, it was like a loan in a sense. He owed the mother money. But it doesn't matter. That's enough to be considered motel. If they got 200, the others can get the 500, even if there's nothing left after to be d divided evenly. Because, again, this is going to be a subject of debate. But according to the Mishnah, the Ketuba can function as the motel. And then it's enough, right? We've had some Torah laws of inheritance. You guys got 200, we got 500. Everyone got inheritance. Mimai, how do we know this? Because it doesn't say that the second ones can collect only if, you know, the second in, in order, meaning the first wife's children can collect even, only if there's a motar dinar. Now, first of all, it never said they could collect at all, okay? It said the first ones, right, the, the second wife gets first, which meant that the second, the kids of the first wife can collect as well, and it didn't say motar dinar, so it must be that the ketubah could be a motar dinar. Ush, okay, those first two assumptions are going to be or questioned by Ravashi. Ush mamina, third assumption, ketubah benin dichrin lo The the obligation, the the um, the fact that you can get a ketubah benin dichrin does not allow you to collect it from lean property. Okay, it's not connected to lean property. Why? Now they say something a little ridiculous. But if theoretically you could collect the between different from lean property, well, you could say, okay, so the father's money went to the sons of the second wife for payment of a loan for the ketubah money. Well, that money used to be in the possession of the father. It's kind of like lean property. It, the sons of the first wife can come and just grab it from them and say, hey, that was lean to our ketuba, we get it. From the fact that they obviously can't do this shows that ketuba and dikrin can never be demanded from lean property. So Makifla Ravashi. Ravashi now questions the first two assumptions, one by one. Mimai, where are you getting this from? Dilmalolam emelacha. Now, no one made mention in the mission of ketuba and dikrin. Did you notice that? Right? I immediately explained it as ketuba and dikrin, as did the Gemara, but never really said that. You can explain it differently. You could say the opposite of what the Gemara inferred. You don't get Ketubin and Dichrin in this case. Umayk, because again, why? Because we're worried it's going to cause fighting between them. Umayk Kodmim, so what does it mean? Yorshe Harishona Kodmim Liyorshe Ashniya. What does it mean that they're, sorry, 
יורשי השנייה קודמים ליורשי הראשונה. The second wife's kids come first, right? They get their ketubah. We assume that meant before the heirs of the first wife can collect their ketubah in Dichri. Comes Rav Ashi and he says, what are you talking about? What does it mean, could mean? It means first you take the 200 for the ketubah. That comes out of the estate before anything. Then what do you do? What it means is, then the second heirs, the, the, the second group, the first wife's heirs, can come and do what? Say we want to be part of the inheritance now, and whatever's left, let's say there's 500 left, is divided evenly between all the sons. Who said it's time back to be indifferent? Now, what made you think it? Well, the chitema, your sheha rishona lamali. Why are they called the heirs of the first wife, if not that we're referring to what do they want to inherit from their mother? That's not a good proof. I did because it said the second one and her heirs, it then said the Yorshim of the first. In other words, it was talking about the wife and her heirs. So when it talks about the, the, the first wife's heirs, how to better mention them other than saying the heirs of the first wife. But it has nothing to do with Ketubah Nindichrin. It just means after we take the original 200 for the Ketubah, that the second wife's kids get the Ketubah because they're deserving of that. After that, everything's divided evenly between the brothers, and this doesn't even talk about Ketubah Nindichrin. So Rav Ashi rejects the, that first assumption. And they're going to now reject the second. Utkamarita Ketubah Naseh Motar Lechaverita. No, you could say Ketubah does not count as a motor. You need 701, right? You need 200 for the first, 500 for the second, and an extra one in order for those, the group of the first wife's kids to be able to collect their 500. And you can say the mission is referring to a case where there was a motor dinner. The mission never said how much money was in the estate. They never talked about, right? All the assumptions we made before were, we're assuming that's all there is. But who said that's all there is? Maybe there's more. And maybe it's just saying, first they get the 200, then they get their 500, and then whatever's left in the estate is divided evenly between all the brothers. Okay, so period. So he basically says, you can't prove what you tried to prove, those two first assumptions. However, he says, this thing of achab achayav achab emoto is actually machlok atanaim. Okay? So while it might not be our mission saying so, or it's not clear whether our mission is saying it, but in fact it's a machlok between Ben Nanas and Rabbi Akiva. Ditanya. Meitu achab achayav achab emoto. Okay, our mission didn't necessarily say explicitly it was talking about that case. And ketub adin dichrin. But this is going to be much more clear, although even within this there's going to be a debate. So achab achayav achab emoto. Two wives, one dies in his lifetime, one dies after his death. Ben Nana Somer. Yecholim b'nei arishona lomar l'b'nei ashniya. The first wife's children who want to get their ketubin in Dichrin can say to the second wife's children, b'nei ba'alat chovatem. You have an obligation to collect. Okay, get your chov. Tlu ketubat imchem. Go get your mother's ketubah. V'tseyu. And then leave. And then you're done because all that's left is for us and you get no inheritance. That sounds pretty clear like we get our ketubin in Dichrin. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Kfar Kavtsan Nachalam Elefnei Bnei Arishona Venafla Elefnei Bnei Ashnia. It's not the most clear line here. He says, okay, let's say it literally, and then we'll explain what he means. The Nachala from the Bnei Arishona, meaning what they wanted to collect their Ktupin in Dichrin, Kfar Kavtsa, it it left entirely. Venafla Elefnei Bnei Ashnia, and it went to the second ones. Okay, it doesn't exactly mean that, but what it means is. They lost their rights to Ketubin and Dichrin in this case. Okay? There's no Ketubin and Dichrin. The Takana of Ketubin and Dichrin was not instituted in a case like this. Okay? Why? Because it's going to cause fighting. Because in this case, where the first one, where, the sec, where there's imbalance, the second ones get a Ketubah, and you now want to claim your Ketubin and Dichrin, and they're going to get no inheritance, that's going to cause a lot of fighting. So as soon as they demand a Ketubah, and they get a ketubah, the second group, that precludes you from being able to collect ketubah in Dichrin because it's just going to cause fighting. Because the ketubah is kind of a separate thing. That they get, but they don't get any inheritance. And they're going to be very upset that they didn't get inheritance. And therefore, you go... The whole institution of ketubah in Dichrin was not for a situation like this. Ketubah in Dichrin was instituted when the husband dies after the wife and 
you know, after both wives, let's say there's more sons, right? He dies at the end, and then we can, you know, how is his inheritance going to be split up, but not when one is getting a ketuba. Okay? My love. So now the Gemara explains. My love. Is this not the root of their machloke? Mar savar chab chayav el chab moto yesh lam ketuba nirin dichrin. Umar savar chab chayav el chab moto and lam ketuba nirin dichrin. Okay, that's what I just said. That's the machloke. So I'm a rabbi. Eshkachtinu le rabbanan de beirav de yatve vikam. Rabbi says, I saw the rabbis in the house of Rav. Sat and explained this machloket differently. De kule alma echad b'chayav echad b'moto yesh lahem k'chupanim dichrin. Everyone agrees they get k'chupanim dichrin. What's the machloket though? Hacha b'k'chuba na'aset motar l'chaver tam. The machloket is can a k'chuba? Okay, now we're moving on to the second inference the Gemara had. Can a k'chuba be considered motar? So in the case where there's only seven hundred. And the first ones collected their two of 200. And the other ones want to now get their 500. Can we say they can get it because there's Motar Dinar, because the 200 that they collected is already considered like they got inheritance? Or not? Okay? And come, the students of Rav, and say not only that, it would be the same thing if there's a Baal Chov. Okay? If someone's owed money from the estate. Okay? So let's say, forget about it. It's the same thing as a Ketuba. Let's say there's someone owed money from the estate. So right now in the estate, there's, let's say, um, right, there's two of 200, two of 500, and there's someone who's owed 200, okay? So, and there's 900 in the estate. So now, can we say that the 900 is considered the, that there's motar, okay? Or let's say, forget there were two, right, that there was a ketuba for the other one. Let's say just one has ketuba different of 500. There's this, Loan owed of two hundred on the estate, so it's like a, a lien on the lo- on the estate, right? There's money they owe, and now the the banim different want to come and say, look, we're going to take five hundred. We're still leaving two hundred in the estate, even though it's owed to someone else. That is enough to be considered motar. Okay, you could see that they're not exactly the same because in the ketuba case, sons are inheriting something. In this case, the sons will end up inheriting nothing. But according to the students of Rav, it's the same for Balchov. And Mar Savar, the other opinion says, Ketub, right, this is Rabbi Akiva, says, Ketubah nasei motar l'chaverta, uh, sorry, Ain motar l'chaverta, Rabbi Akiva says, you can't say the Ketuba can be motar l'chaverta. And that's why they can't get Ketubah nindichrin in this case. That's why Kafza, right, it left them, and there's no Ketubah nindichrin. And obviously not a Baal Chov. When Rabbi says, I heard the students say this, I modified it a little bit, and I said, When it comes to Baal Chov, everybody agrees that it's Motar. The Machloket is about a Ketuba. Okay? In other words, he disagrees about the Baal Chov. Okay, he says, that doesn't work. But when it comes to Ketuba, I think it would work. Anyway, he just didn't think that you should apply the same Machloket to if there's a Baal Chov. Now, so again, we started with this Machloket, trying to say Ben Nanas and Rabbi Akiva are fighting about whether there's Kuban and Dichrin or not. Came Rabba and said, the students of Rabba said that this whole Machloket is all about can one Ketubah be considered Motar for the other? That's the debate between them and not the Ketubah and Dichrin, which basically means issue two that they said, Shmami, now that you can infer from our mission and not issue one. Comes Rav Yosef and says, I disagree with you. Ela Amar Rav Yosef, Be'echad Be'chayav Be'echad Be'moto Kam Be'fligin. I disagree with you. He doesn't say why, but he says, I'm sure they're... Oh, sorry. I skipped it. He does explain why. Matkifla Rav Yosef. I skipped a few lines. Let's go back. Rav Yosef says, Ihachi, Rabbi Akiva Omer Kfar Kafsana Chala. The language of Rabbi Akiva doesn't match what you're saying. What should he have said? Im yesh motar dinar rebayale. Rabbi Akiva should have said, if there's motar dinar, then you can get it. And if not, not. If the whole thing is, can a ketubu be motar dinar? Obviously, in many cases, there will be Motar Dinar. So he should have explained, if the whole thing is about the Motar Dinar and whether the Ketubah can be considered that or you need Motar Dinar in addition, he should have said that explicitly. The fact that he doesn't use that language and he just says, Far Kaftana Chala from these guys and went to those guys, it's clear that that's not what he thinks, that it's not the Motar Dinar issue. Ela Amar Rav Yosef, Bechab Chayav, Bechab Motar Kamifl again, it must be understood the way we understood it originally, that it's all a machloket about Ketubah and Dichrin or not. The last thing we're going to see for today is Hanei Tnai Ki Hanei Tnai. Comes Rav Yosef and he says not only that, but I'll show you another brighter where they have the exact same debate. 
And this is going to be a big subject of debate in the next stuff, which is we're going to see different opinions about whether this debate is, whether this debate and this mission, we're basically going to say this brighter that we're, sorry, brighter, the brighter that we're quoting right now doesn't necessarily mean what Rav Yosef thought of it. Okay? So now we're going to read this brighter, the time. Nasa ishto rishona vameta. Okay, Nasa ishto rishona, he marries the first woman and she dies. Nasa ishto shnia vamet, vamet who, and then he dies. Okay, same, right, this is the case we saw before, exact same thing. It's going to be a very unclear Mishnah. That's why you're going to see, uh, Brighta, which is why you're going to see there was a whole debate about how to understand this. Okay, this sounds like Ketubin in Dichrin, right? They get their Ketuba. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Im yesh motar dinar, elon otin Ketubat iman, ve'elon otin Ketubat iman. If there's motar dinar, then they can each collect their Ketubas. Ve'im lav, but if not, cholkin b'shaveh. Then, okay, after, now, obviously, the first ones are going to get their ketubah. Uh, sorry, not the first ones, the, fir- the ones who are deserving it first. The ones of the second wife are obviously going to get their ketubah. But if there's motar dinar, then they can go, you know, then they can get their ketubah. So now, um, miyesha motar dinar, elon zin ve'elon otzlim, ve'im lav, cholkim b'shavet. And if not, they divide it equally. In other words, either... Right? So again, there's two options. If there's Motar Dinar, then they get their Ktuba, the first, right, the second wife. Then the first wife's kids come and get their Ktuba, Benin Dichrin, and then they split the rest of the inheritance equally. But if there's no Motar Dinar, then Chokim B'Shavet, after the second ones get their Ktuba, the rest of it's divided. That 500 that's left. Okay? If there's just 700, the 500 will be divided evenly. So now, is this not the same machloket? Demar savar Rabbi Shimon holds a chaba chayav a chaba moto yesh lem ketupin in dichrin. Umar savar and Tanakama says a chaba chayav a chaba moto ain bahem ketupin in dichrin. And he says, right? Um, one second. Just want to check one thing. Right, the way he explains it, one second, is a little differently. B'nai Rishonah, don't get their ketubah in Dichrin. Right, the Rabbi Shimon is saying, if there's Motor Dino, then there's ketubah in Dichrin. And Tanakama is saying, they don't get ketubah in Dichrin, because Nasa, Banim B'nai Shalzeh, Lachar Mitav, and Olim Ketubah. Oh, sorry. Okay, I read it wrong. Okay, let's go back for a minute. I made a mistake. In other words, only the second ones get their ketubah. The rest of it is divided among the brothers. And Rabbi Shimon says, no, as long as there's a motar dinar, the first ones can get their ketubah in dichrin. Sorry that I read it wrong. Okay, so the Tanakhama basically sounds like he's saying only the second wife's children are allowed to collect their ketubah. And not the first wives. The rest of the money is going to be divided evenly. That sounds like Enkchubin in Dichrin. And Rabbi Shimon says, as long as in Motar Dinar, there's Ketubin in Dichrin and they can accept it. So it sounds like he's saying there is Ketubin in Dichrin. To which the Gemara is going to now, again, going forward, we're going to stop here for today, is going to start saying, what are you talking about? There could be, oh, it's, since the language is really unclear here, there are going to be many possibilities about what exactly you could say is going on here. Okay, and then we're going to bring a whole bunch of other options to explain the machloka between Tanakam and Rabbi Shimon, which in the end is going to say there's not another machloka Tanim about it, but we're still left with Rabbi Kiban ben Nanas, at least according to the way Ravashi understood them, and Rabbi Yosef supported that, which is that there is a machloka about there is a doing different. I just want to see one thing whether it's really Ravashi who said it or it's just the Gemara saying it. Yeah, the truth is, it's just the Gemara. It's not Rav Ashi who says it. The Gemara establishes a Machloka Tanaim, and then Rav Yosef confirmed that it's a Machloka Tanaim between Ben Nanas and Rabbi Akiva, even though Rabba and the students of Rav had a different way of understanding that Machloka. Okay, so again, we started with saying, let's infer that that's true from our Mishnah. Then we said, not necessarily. Rav Ashi said, you can't necessarily infer that. We tried to say, maybe it's a Machloka Tanaim. Not 100% clear whether it's a Machloka Tanaim. Rav Yosef is further trying to prove his a machlokat from this bright but he's not going to be able to do that either. 
But maybe Ben Nanas and Rabbi Kiva are really arguing about this. With that, we'll finish for today. Wishing everyone a Gemara Chatima Tova and a good fast.